For those of you who may not have been here yesterday, our speaker for the Nathan Meyer Memorial Series in Bible Exposition this year is Pastor Jim Rose. Pastor Rose served as senior pastor of churches for 38 years in Iowa, Florida, Texas, Connecticut, and New York City. He's a member of Dallas Seminary's Board of Regents, as well as several other ministry boards, and he continues to preach and teach both nationally as well as internationally. He's a native of Jacksonville, Florida. He graduated before coming to Dallas Seminary from Georgia Institute of Technology back in 1958 with a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Engineering. He worked in the aerospace program for five years before attending DTS. He and his wife, the former Phyllis Ann Killian, have been married for 47 years and have two sons and five wonderful grandsons. Jim and Phyllis Ann are special friends of us, uh, of me, of the seminary. We're delighted to have them here this week. Phyllis, would you stand again and let them see who you are? Great. And then would you join me again in welcoming Pastor Rose to our platform this morning? We'll be this morning in Second Timothy, chapter 2. If you were to drive to our town of Llano, Texas, that's where we moved after we left Austin, but you were to continue going west on Route 16, you would come to a very unusual city in the hill country. It is <clears throat> famous for an unexpected reason. It's true, G. Harvey, the Western artist and follower of Christ, lives there and has his studio. Robert E. Lee, which may be most important to some of us, spent the night there once on his way to Mexico and the Mexican Wars. But that's not it. It is famous for its favorite son, Chester William Nimitz. Admiral Nimitz, commander of the Northern Pacific Forces in World War II, took a Navy out of decimation, the decimation of Pearl Harbor, built it back, and led it to final victory. If you were to stop at the Nimitz Museum, which is right there on the main street, you can't miss it, and you were to go in, the first display that you would see would be a series of rooms depicting Chester Nimitz's life. You see all of the things that he went through and the awards he received and the great things he was able to do. But the secret to his victory and his success is something very easy to miss. It is on a very small plaque in that first room. On it, there is an inscription that reads, Leadership consists of picking good men and helping them do their best. Chester Nimitz. Of course, that is not new with Admiral Nimitz. He was merely reflecting the remedy for success of another warrior. The man whose letter we have been looking at who's come to the end of the fight. He says in his, what we call the second chapter of Second Timothy, he says to his young, and not so young anymore, son in the faith, Timothy this, you therefore, verse 1, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. Paul's success was found in this. He had done what he recommended to Timothy. In fact, he doesn't recommend it, he commands it. 
And yet, Paul knows that we face a battle that is far more intense and far broader than any world war, one, two, or three when it comes. And so he tells us the power we will need, the strength we will need to win in this war. He states it in an unusual way. Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And we would expect be strong in the Holy Spirit <clears throat> or something like that. But he comes to grace because grace in Christ, and it's really not two concentric circles, it is one. Grace is Christ in us. It is the strength of grace that allows us not only to engage in this battle, but to entrust, and that is what he really tells him, entrust to others the treasure and the training, and that's part of it that has been given to us. Grace, of course, as you know, in a well-taught place like this, is that which we have received through Christ in us that we do not deserve, and yet he gives it to us gladly if we walk by obedient faith in him. It is the mind of Christ, it, it's the might of Christ, and finally it's the map for life he's giving us and giving you. And so Paul says this is where it starts. If you're going to be in this battle, if you are going to pursue this calling, you're going to have to have the power of grace, grace power. And it is grace power that allows us to be entrusters. As Nimitz said, to pick good men and help them do their best. To pick good women and help them do their best. It's what we need because grace power helps us understand who we are and who Christ is. The first thing grace power does for us, it delivers us from discouragement. You may have the experience I've had often, in fact, recently. Get up to preach to a group and, or a church and wonder, why in the world am I here? What do I have to offer? And discouragement can pour in. But the grace that is Christ Jesus tells us you really have nothing to give. But I have given you something. It is my word which if you deliver it, the power of the Spirit of God will apply it to lies. So go do it. It also delivers us from being impressed with ourselves. And there's a lot of that going around. <laughs> we come to present, to entrust, and we have the temptation of entrusting not the treasure, but the forms and the various programs we've put together around it. In the town that we served in our last eight years, Austin, Texas, we have a plethora of churches that have started and fallen because they did not come with an entrusted treasure that is the word and truth of God, but rather with a committed form or function of somehow other, some way that another church did it in another town. It doesn't work. They had bought the sizzle and not the steak. And so we come to this, and if God's grace is working in our life, if we have that power, we know that what we have to entrust is not what we have come up with, our forms, but what is foundational, this truth, the Word of God, and how God has applied it to our lives through others. Of course, to do that is absolutely crucial to our ministry. There is nothing more important than this step. We call it mentoring. When I was here, we called it discipleship. I don't know what we'll call it next, but uh, we call it something. But what it is, Paul calls it entrusting. I found out very early in the ministry that when we do not entrust to others what has been entrusted to us so they can stand with us and go on to replace us, we don't like that word, replace. We think we're forever. We're not. But what we do with this is we look at it and we tend to push it aside. We like to preach and retreat or get into something else that exciting is exciting. Teach and, and then 
sort of fade away into something else interesting rather than taking the time to pour ourselves into other people. As I said, early in our ministry, we were in Clearwater, Florida. Very exciting work. I was the first pastor with this work, and that's always exciting. It was dynamic. We were going to we were going to come up with those things that would turn America around, and God gave us a, a good run. But what we didn't do, that is the leadership, the elders, the staff, we didn't bother to entrust this truth to see people grow up to step in behind us. And we started rotating our elders off the board, and suddenly we looked around as a staff, and we had people on our elder board who had absolutely no idea how to carry a church forward in Jesus Christ. And we had to play catch up and we almost lost the whole thing. And God, through his spirit, taught us a great lesson. From that moment on, entrusting has been a huge part of our lives, both Phyllis Ann and mine. Paul says it's supposed to be. But when we're entrusting, of course, we have to decide, well, who are we going to entrust to? Now, this is not a basic discipleship class or a new Christian class. This is choosing those men and those women that God's hand is on, really recognizing the people who've been marked. And they're marked in two ways. He says they are faithful and they are sufficient. That's really the word, able to teach, sufficient to teach. That's the same word Paul uses in 2 Corinthians when he says, who is sufficient to these things, which brings us back to grace. These people then will have two characteristics. They will be faithful in what they are doing and they will have the ability to do these things. I take it is the, it is the ability to teach, but in that there is also the ability to lead. That is to gather other people so they can entrust to them this treasure, their training, and the teaching of this word so they can take it on to others. We need to be looking for those people. And then we need to be ready to pour ourselves out to them. And that's really what it takes. This entrusting is a lifetime work. And one of the things that I was telling our president last night is you realize after you've been out of the seminary a while is how absolutely crucial it is and how much you owe to the education you got, but more than that, to those who poured their lives in you. Some of those men are on this platform, and I will be forever grateful that they have entrusted to me what was entrusted to them. Of course, all of these men and women who are here are doing that. And it's not an easy thing. <clears throat> they stay here and year after year pour themselves out in this work. It's not easy because Paul now says to be an entruster, you have to be a triple threat. And he gives us three metaphors. The first is what we would call a master metaphor because it really is one of his favorite pictures and it controls the others. And I believe we have to attach verses three or verse three to one and two because they go together. He first tells Timothy, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You have to be a soldier to be an entruster. You have to be a soldier to pick good people and help them do their best. And that's because, as Paul says again and again, we're in a war. We're in a fight. And I think you know that. I, I really sense that. That's something I love about the young men and women we work with now, they're far more attuned to what they're going to face. But if you missed it, there's a battle going on. And the key for a good soldier is first that she or he engage the enemy. If Paul is going to go on to say that uh, no soldier, in verse 4, in active service entangles himself or herself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. The focus, the dedication of a soldier is the mission. Uh, Mark left out one part of our bio. We don't throw it in, but I served in the military during the Cold War. And many of you you have done that. So I talked to a young man who's in the chap is going into the chaplaincy that's been in the Air Force. And in the military, we know the reason we are signed up is to fulfill the mission. 
In that mission, of course, we are blessed. Both our enlister and our commander is the same person, Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of armies, and he has one basic mission for us, and that is to engage the enemy. And if we present him, as we said yesterday, boldly, we are going to not have to worry about that. The enemy will thus be engaged. Timothy's problem was he was disengaging. And that is why Paul is saying this. Be a good soldier. If we engage the enemy, then the second thing Paul says begins to happen. We begin as a soldier to endure hardship. Now that hardship is not the persecution of the enemy. It's rather the rigors of soldiering. It's very costly to soldier. And that is why he says the person who soldiers doesn't entangle himself in the bios of everyday life, that is, the affairs of everyday living. That doesn't mean that she is not concerned with finances, he is not concerned with the house he lives in or where he lives, <clears throat> but these can't be something that tie us down. They can't be things that grab us and entangle us so that when Christ says, hey, engage there, we say, well, you know, Lord, I really didn't want to move here. I like it here. Now, Timothy's reason for disengaging was not that at first. It was first because he was feeling the sting of the people who were opposed to Jesus Christ and his world. But I suspect from what Paul is saying that he began to enjoy being off the battlefield, sleeping between clean sheets and those kinds of things. And soldiers don't do that. I mentioned yesterday I have really enjoyed Tertullian, and one of the things Tertullian says in his address to martyrs fits in here. He says, no soldier comes to the war surrounded by luxuries, nor goes into action from a comfortable bedroom, but from the makeshift and narrow tent where every kind of hardness and severity and unpleasantness is to be found. Our youngest son uh, is a West Point graduate, and he was in special forces. He was an airborne ski trooper, if you can imagine all this stuff. And we used to go up and see them. He was on a hot pack up in Alaska. And one of the things you were very aware of was that he and his men lived with their focus on the mission. They were ready to engage at a moment, and they would be called. They would go and get on their airplanes that were over at Richardson Air Force Base, and away they'd go. Doesn't matter whether his dad is coming or not. I didn't think that was very good, but they didn't seem to care. <laughs> He was focused on that. And so a good soldier, the first thing he must do is engage the enemy. And secondly, he must be ready to endure hardships because she or he is in the battle. Unfortunately, the uh, most recent Gulf War revealed that some of the people who had signed up hadn't signed up to fight. Now, they'd signed up to go to college <clears throat> or to get a monthly check in the reserves. And all of a sudden they said, you're up. They said, oh, no, we didn't plan on that. Well, I think that's partly the military's fault. I remember that ad, the stupid ad the Army had, and that's the group I served with. The Army wants to join you. Well, if they're joining me, we're staying home, so don't go. <laughs> the Christ Army, we're not joining. He's not joining us. We have joined him, and when he says engage, we do it. And so a good soldier is one who engages the enemy and endures hardship. Then he is ready to entrust. And I want to say it is only then that that happens. One of the blessings of being out this long you know, is knowing a lot of these men and women that are up here and knowing they are warriors. And they are engaging and they're enduring. They're doing it so they can commit to you. You know others who are doing that. That's our call. And you see, a soldier, the basic part of his mission in the engaging and the enduring, a basic part, is to entrust. When our son Mark was at West Point, we used to go there often, and we were up in that area his last year, and I was amazed at those who taught military tactics, the basic things of a soldier. They were all veterans who had done well in combat themselves. They were people who engaged and who were willing to endure, and yet the army thought it important enough that they come back 
and in trust. Of course, the Air Force does the same thing. The Navy does. The top guns come back and teach in the San Diego area. And that is what God calls us to do. He calls us to be engaging. And that's the first thing. Don't miss that. I've been reading Shira's book, or I just read it. It's also a movie now, Gods and Generals. And you feel for President Lincoln. He has all these generals. They have wonderful credentials, but they never seem to be able to find Robert E. Lee. He's right over there, but they just can't quite get to him. They wouldn't engage. He finally found Grant, and he would engage anybody. And so... <laughs> A soldier, then, is one who engages, endures, and he entrusts. But a soldier is also something else. As I said, we are triple threat. The second thing a soldier is, notice verse 5, and if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. A soldier is also, in a sense, an athlete. Paul likes that figure, not as much as the soldiering one in the war one, but he likes it. Paul is using the picture of the Greco-Roman games, and what he literally says is they must compete lawfully. You who are reading the old text know that, and it's, there's ambiguity in the statement. You see, there are two ways that you had to be lawful or you had to fulfill the rules to compete in a race or in a wrestling match in the Roman and Greek games. The first was you had to prepare for ten months. And it was rigorous. You had to work on it. And then you had to come and present to the authorities a vow and testimonies. She really did that. He really did that. Then secondly, once you got in the race or in the contest, you kept the rules. You competed lawfully. You didn't dare violate. We were in New York and... The New York Marathon, we used to watch the end of it every year. We watched it from a restaurant that overlooked it. It was wonderful. We ate there, you know, and vicariously felt like we'd done a lot. <laughs> Our second year, the race went on, and somebody came in in record time. And uh, this young man, everybody's gathering around him until they discovered he had taken a subway about uh, two-thirds into the race, and the last third he rode. <laughs> That's not lawful, and you couldn't do that. We do both. First, my brothers and sisters, we're never going to get over preparing. It's not ten months, it's a lifetime. I want to tell you, we want to be in this book every day for ourselves, mining this treasure, never stopping. We want to be developing our devotional life until praying becomes, as Brother Lawrence said, practicing the presence of God. We want to be reading collateral. We want to know what's happening out there then we'll be a person who is able to entrust. And then in the race, we want to have a precise purity wrapped in a visible graciousness so that people see in us the grace and truth that was in Jesus Christ. If we do that, we will then be involved in the entrusting process, where a soldier entrusts through exhortation. An athlete entrusts through example. Examples energize. We have a great example of that in Austin, Texas. If you decide to go to Austin, you need a shot of true liberalism. Go there. It's, it's slightly left of anything you've ever thought of unless you live in San Francisco. Uh, you will find another thing you really have to watch out for, and that is bicycles. Everywhere you drive, there are bicycles. In fact, some of our major streets are now half bicycle tracks. And these are serious bicyclers. They're like Dr. Allen. I mean, they have the little suits and they have the bikes that are handmade and they spend more on their bikes than they do on their car. And they're all over. They're everywhere. What they're doing is following an example. You see, five times Tour de France winner. Lance Armstrong is from Austin. He's an incredible guy. I wish he knew Jesus Christ. You know, we were, my son, my youngest one, is a serious biker, and I was talking to him about Lance Armstrong, and he told me something that it's been on television and print, but 
A few years ago, before his, or right after his fourth win, somebody floated the story, as we like to do in these days, that he was on something. He couldn't do this unless he was on some type, type of drug, type of steroid. And so they, they interviewed him, and they studied it, and they checked it, and he was on nothing. And so finally, one of the reporters in an interview session says, well, how do you do it? What are you on that allows you to win? He says, I'm on my, and he didn't use bicycle, but I'm on my bicycle six hours a day in the rain and cold. I'm always getting ready. And in Austin, you have people who have picked up that example, in fact, across America, and are on bikes. If we live Christ that way, those we're entrusting to will be energized by our example. The third example is not nearly as exciting. And I know how not exciting it is. I, got a, I picked up a quote from Mool. Mool has a really excellent small commentary on Second Timothy, and I hadn't really used it, but I was reading through it this time for this series. And it's, it's a quote about a farmer. Let's just look at the passage. Six, the hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive the share of the crops. And we're going to stop with that. The third thing a soldier or the, must be, not only a soldier, that's his dedication, an athlete, that's his discipline. He must be a hard, she must be a hard-working farmer. That's determination. Now, farming is not only hard work, nobody sees you. Uh, Mool says this, the farmer's life is totally devoid of excitement, remote from all glamour and applause, and that's true. I've moved, as I said, to Llano, Texas. We live in the middle of 20,000 acres of serious ranch country. We don't have one of the 20,000. We only have 10 of it, so we have a ranch yet. But at, anyway, <laughs> I found out that all ranchers are also farmers. They have to be. They're growing winter wheat. They're growing maize. They're growing this. And the other thing I found out, they, I mean, I don't have to worry. When I get through with my studies about noon, I study every morning till about noon. The rest of the day, I don't have to worry about what I do with my 10 acres. I've always got 35 things to do out there to, to do some farming. We're, we're trying to plant seeds right now. And I've watched these guys who are planting their crops. And our seeds are for grass. Theirs are for the animals. And nobody goes by and says... Boy, that's the greatest furrow I ever saw. And look at that winter wheat. <laughs> Nobody knows. And so a farmer is one who works hard, who plows, and is doing it with hard-working determination. Our yard, I'm, we have guests that come now and then, and we love doing that at our home. And, you know, I'm trying to put grass into this yard, and I am working hard on this grass. And I'm planting, and, and, and one of the things a farmer has to have with his plowing, and, and that's the entrusting, in planting this truth, this training in another, is patience. Because it doesn't come up the next day. And I planted my first bunch of seeds and went out and looked the next day, and nothing happened. So I dug a couple of them up, and they looked the same. And you know, farmer that I am, I learned not to do that. They all laughed at me. But now I am working and nobody sees it. The only thing I get is when people come to our place, they love our house, and as they're leaving, they usually say something like, it'll be great when you, get, you, know, you have some landscaping, and I want to kill them right there. <laughs> I don't. I hold back. The farmer is one who is plowing. He is determined to work hard, but she is patient waiting for that crop to grow. I believe that's why Paul puts at the end of this that the hard-working farmer ought to be first to receive his share, her share of the crop. We do sometimes receive a share of the crop when those we are entrusting with our training suddenly blossom and begin to entrust it to others and we are blessed by that. But I believe Paul's primary goal, because this letter is very, very eschatological, it looks at the future constantly, is that sharing in the crop, when we all stand with Jesus and that which we planted, that which we've entrusted in others, suddenly we see the results of that. Christ doesn't miss any of it. 
and we share in that reward. I've often wondered if Lois, Timothy's grandmother, ever saw the fruit of her entrustment. I ask that because my grandmother never did. You see, the person who had the greatest influence in bringing me to Jesus Christ was my grandmother. And then in the early stages of building me in Christ because she saw something, a little bit of faithfulness, a little bit of ability. She was the first one to really begin entrusting in me, and then my wife picked up that. Women have meant a lot in my life. But my grandmother never saw the results. But she kept entrusting in her grandson until her last breath. We want to do the same thing. Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, get with it. Get with it. Be an entruster. Be giving to others, picking them out and teaching them helping them do their very best. But Timothy's problem was more basic than that. And that is why Paul says, be a good soldier. Because first you've got to engage in the battle before you can entrust the truth. Timothy had begun to push back from the battlefield. He had been in it and he looked around and it looked to him like they were losing the battle. And why would you want to entrust anyone with what you have received to come and stand with you and stand after you go for you in your place if what you're in is a losing cause? Paul is telling him it isn't. In 211 B.C., Hannibal, the Carthaginian, who hated Rome intensely, had led the armies of Carthage within three miles of the gates of the city of Rome itself. The Roman Senate was meeting on the day they arrived in full session and in full panic. One after another, the senators rose and said, we have to come to some terms of surrender with this Carthaginian. Others disagreed. One senator got up and said, no, we have to do it. Understand, we have lost the battle. At that point, an old senator who had been quiet rose to his feet. He was a general in the army of Rome, a general of the Republic. On his body were the scars of having fought for that Republic. And as he rose, the gallery quieted. Then with steel-hard simplicity, he looked at his fellow senators and said, Senators of Rome, we have lost the battle. But I remind you, Rome does not go to battle. Rome goes to war. And they beat I remind you, you may go out there and find you're in a fight and suddenly you're losing the battle. And we will be in some losses. But remember, our general Jesus Christ has not gone to battle. He has gone to war. And he is winning. Father, let us engage and endure and then give all we have to entrust to others what you have given us. In the name of our commander and the one who gave himself for us.